Hello, I'm Diana Thomas. And I'm Tom Harper. Welcome to that Wilbur Smith Show. A podcast about the historical, geographical, natural and human background to the world of Wilbur Smith. I wanted to come to the Volga, to a definite place, to a definite city. It accidentally bears the name of Stalin himself. I do not think I went after it on that account. Indeed, it could have an altogether different name. A gigantic terminal was there. I wanted to take it. And you know, we have it. There are only a couple of very small places left. I'll take them with a few small shock units. I don't want to make a second Verdun. The contrast between the bantering tone of the speech and the bitter reality of the Battle of Stalingrad was grotesque. Gerhardt glanced across to Vert, who had raised his eyes to the ceiling, and was biting his lip as he fought the urge to shout back at the radio. Vert caught Gerhardt's eye and shook his head in silent disbelief. Then he moved closer to Gerhardt and whispered, Do you think he knows? Does he have the first idea? Gerhardt looked back and said, Tell me, out of yes or no, which do you think would be the worst answer? And that was an extract from Courtney's War, uh, written by Wilbur Smith, uh, co-writing with someone called David Churchill, uh, who is in fact one of the many aliases of my co-host, Diana Thomas. Um, and in this episode this week, we're recording it almost a year to the day since the fall of Mariupol and the site of urban fighting Uh, desperate soldiers holed up in gigantic Soviet-era factories. Uh, And so it seems a very good time to be uh, thinking about the Battle of Stalingrad and what that meant for the the period, uh, how it features in the novel Courtney's War, uh, and the way it continues to echo down into the present. So, Diana, uh, you worked on this, and those words you quoted, the the speech that they're listening to... uh, How authentic is that? Absolutely authentic. Those are the words of Adolf Hitler um, as he spoke them in a speech given in November 1943 on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the uh, Bierkeller Putsch in Munich, in which he and his early Nazi associates and their brown shirt thugs um, tried to seize control of the Bavarian government and use that as a springboard for their eventual domination of um, Germany, which at the time seemed laughably implausible, but of course turned out very much not to be. Um, and, And it falls kind of at the very middle of the middle book of what I could think of as the War Cry trilogy, which is the story of Saffron Courtney and her German um, lover, uh, Gerhard von Mirbach, um, which follows Saffron's story from um, when she was a little girl in the 20s in Kenya, through the beginning of the Second World War, then the whole of the Second World War, and then after that, when Saffron and Gerhardt returned to Kenya, um, goes into the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya, although the shadow of Nazism still hangs over that book as well. Yeah, because this is a book that, um, and I'm assuming this is a deliberate choice, absolutely starts in, I think, April 1939, uh, just before the war breaks out, uh, and it ends in, um, I guess, May 1945, uh, as the war finishes. It does, yeah, yeah. So it's completely contiguous with uh, the timeline of, of, of the Second World War. Presumably that was a choice that this book want, is going to span the entirety of that conflict. It's sort of accidental, really, because this, this particular book, um, Courtney's War, um, was really not considered at all because the original brief was um, that Wilbur would like me to co-write a sequel to Asagai, um, just one sequel. And Asagai is set in Kenya in the years before the First World War. And um, the Courtney in question is Leon Courtney, um, who's sort of one of those members of various sub-branches of the Courtney family that weave in and out of history. And he has been cashiered um, unfairly 
because he's been wrongly accused of cowardice and thrown out of the King's African Rifles. He sets up as a game hunter, and one of his clients is a bullet-headed Prussian baron um, called Otto von Mirbach, who runs a great big um, industrial complex and has a mistress um, called Eva, who um, Leon Courtney falls in love with, thinking that she's German. She's in fact not. She's a British spy who's, who's kind of spying on, on von Mirbach. And to cut a long story short, Asaga ends at the beginning of the First World War and um, Otto von Mirbach has set off to southern Africa um, in, a, in a zeppelin carrying a load of gold, which they're going to give to South African uh, supporters of Germany and sympathizers of Germany to ferment a rebellion against the British and thereby weaken the British in Africa. And um, Leon kills Otto and runs away with Eva. And, they, and Eva is pregnant at the time of the book ends, which is the, actually the end of the First World War. There's a kind of coda at the end of the book. And so, and so the, I, my idea was when we were first talking about, about a sequel, well, let's make it about the children of the characters in Asagai. So the daughter of Leon and Eva is Saffron Courtney. And... Otto has two sons um, with his wife, Athlo. One of them is, is Conrad, the older son, who takes absolutely after his father. And the other is Gerhard, the younger son, who's much more his uh, mother's child and is, um, uh, wants to be an architect. He's very artistic and devastatingly handsome. Anyway, so Saffron and Gerhard are kind of star-crossed lovers. They meet just before the war, as you say. Um, and um, they're star-crossed twice over, firstly because, because the very last person that, that they should be marrying is one another or be falling in love with one another because their families are sworn enemies. So it's proper Montague and Capulet stuff. And also because a Second World War is about to break out. And, and I was struck by the fact that um, Wilbur's works, there's quite, quite a bit about the First World War in, in Sparrow Falls, and the Burning Shore um, and Asagai. Um, but nothing really apart from one book set in Abyssinia. There's very, very little about the Second World War. It'd be fun to go into that particular world. And it happened that I'd been writing about it already and had done a huge amount of research. So I thought, oh good, I can use it twice over. And, and so I basically out of that seed for one sequel, grew three books because the story just kept expanding like Topsy, as I'm sure you've been familiar with the same sort of thing happening. And so Stalingrad is the kind of pivot, really, of, of the trilogy in the same way that it's sort of the pivot of the Second World War and certainly of the Second World War on the Russian front. I mean, Stalingrad is absolutely crucial. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I... I thought of it about being the, the centre of the pivot point of the book, but of course, as you say, the pivot point of the whole trilogy. And that's, um, as any author yeah. knows, that's quite an important point to uh, to, to, to kind of get to. Absolutely. So, yeah, so we've got, we're going to get to Stalingrad. Let's, um, let's just talk a bit more about Gerhard, because he is, and you use the phrase good German, which is a very <laughs> ambiguous, potentially loaded phrase. Well, it's, it, was that, it was that kind of post-war phrase, wasn't it? The idea of the good German who had, who had not been, who was, it wasn't his fault or her fault. They went a Nazi, but they were just caught up in this whole thing, yeah. Yeah, but I, I, can, I can never hear that phrase without kind of thinking of it in inverted quotation Oh, it's very words. loaded, absolutely. Um, yeah, because he because he 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 joins up. So, um, I guess first of all, can you for those who haven't read the book, can you tell us a bit more about his character, yeah. and then um, the the follow on from that is, as as you uh, and Wilbur are working on ri- writing, roughly half the book from the point of view of a German fighting to defend the fatherland. Um, what tell us about the challenges that come with that? Very early on in, in War Cry, Gerhard helps out the, the family lawyer who's been a loyal, Isidore Solomons, who's been a loyal servant and his father before him to the von Mirbach clan. Um, but because he's Jewish, um, um, 
he's kicked out. He loses his, he loses. Conrad kicks him out. Yeah, Conrad Gerhard's nasty brother. Yes, and 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 he's left impoverished. And and um, Gerhard, out of pity, gives Isidore enough money for him and his family to be able to escape Germany and go to Switzerland, which infuriates Conrad. And very, and in, and what happens in War Cry is is basically um, to avoid punishment um, for helping a Jew, like being sent to a camp or something. Um, Gerhardt is punished in a different way, which he is forced to join the Nazi party and to act in every way as if he's a loyal, passionate, committed Nazi. Basically, it's a lie, to make his whole life a lie. Mm. And as part of this, knowing that he's not at all militaristic, Conrad forces him to join the beginnings of what will become the Luftwaffe, because, of course, well, the Germans were only really allowed to have a, an air force after um, after the Treaty of Versailles, but there are all sorts of ways around that. And, and what happens is that Conrad accidentally hugely empowers Gerhardt, who discovers that he loves to fly. He's just a born aviator. And when he's up in the air, he's completely free. He's not pretending to be this awful Nazi. He's he's just in his own little private universe. So he, he, is, he is a brilliant pilot, and this transfers therefore, into service with the Luftwaffe, and he's, he's, a, he's a fighter ace. Okay, so how then do you make this kind of a character acceptable? And the answer is in two ways. In the first place, a number of ways, actually, the Luftwaffe, along with the Africa Corps in, in North Africa, certainly in kind of British post-war mythology, the Luftwaffe were kind of given a pass on Nazism. I mean, they were just flyers, particularly fighter pilots. Not so much bomb, but if you're a fighter pilot, you're kind of a gladiator one-on-one. And there's lots of stuff, for example, about RAF fighter pilots and former Luftwaffe pilots meeting up after the war. And they'd sort of jousted. There was this kind of very medieval idea of these pilots jousting. And it's actually funny, you get that in Sparrow Falls um, and also in 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 um, in, in um, Burning Shore in the First World War. And Wil- Wil- Wilbur, of course, is a great um, lover. I mean, the whole flying thing. His father, I think, loved flying. Loved nothing more than flying. Yes, he had a, he had he had, had the tiger moth. Yeah, and named Wilbur after after Wilbur um, Wright. Absolutely, and by making him a pilot, <clears throat> that took, and and but he realizes also just how awful the kind of Nazi project really is, Gerhard is absolutely committed to the idea that he must somehow bring Hitler down or contribute to that. But in the meantime, you know, he's 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 fighting this war. He's a he's a um, Luftwaffe officer and and he ends up his unit is transferred to Stalingrad. Um, although he first sees it as he's escorting bombers over Stalingrad in the summer of 1942 to sort of soften the city up. And, and at that point, it looks tremendously easy. They're just going to walk into the city. It's going to be a doddless, like as, as, as easy as they walked into Kiev um, the previous year or Smolensk or any of those cities. It's going to be a doddle. But he has this one thing. He looks down from, from his aircraft and he sees that the bombers, which are destroying all the factories in, in, um, in Stalingrad, are turning them into these sort of into these kind of mazes of ruined brickwork and tangled ironwork. And he thinks, my goodness, how's anybody going to get through that? But are they creating kind of these little battlegrounds, which in fact they are. And then the next time we meet him, he's now based in Stalingrad and the full horror, the absolute unspeakable horror of the battle in Stalingrad is becoming clear to him. And, 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 then, and then meanwhile, Hitler, who has actually, who, who's only caused the invasion of, or the attack on Stalingrad as a sort of whim, really, kind of as he describes it, in that, you know, sort of, oh, I thought I'd do it. It's going to be easy. And Hitler is just a bit like Putin talking about Ukraine. You know, Hitler's just completely oblivious to the actual reality of what is actually happening on the ground at his behest. And there's a, a wonderful uh, couple of paragraphs um, where, as you say, when Gerhard's um, first f- f- accompanying this this bombing run over, over Stalingrad, and he looks down, and he goes, "No man could possibly clamber over those ruins." He thought, "No tank could smash its way through them. The craters and broken buildings were like an assault course within which any number of defenders could take cover." 
my God, he thought, what if we haven't destroyed Stalingrad? What if we've made it impregnable? Yeah. Um, I think that's, and in a sense, that's that foreshadows the battle to come very strongly. The other thing that happens at that point, and it's a very brief thing, you meet these girls, teenage girls, um, who are lying in the sun, chatting about what one of them is going to buy for her mother's birthday or name day. And then they hear bombers and they rush not to bomb shelters, but to, to anti-aircraft guns because they've been recruited as anti-aircraft gunners. And indeed, yeah. they're then attacked by, by, by uh, Gerhardt's fighters who are, um, you know, who are by this point used to the fact the Russians use women as pilots and, and, as, and, and as it turns out, as anti-aircraft gunners. But, but it doesn't end well for the girls, but you get getting a hint in the what happens with them of the lengths to which the Russians will go to defend their territory. Um, so, so it's, again, prefaces the other side of the equation, if you like, which is not just what the Germans do, but what the Russians do back. Yeah, and I thought that was really effective. Um, also, in seeing as we're seeing this from the German perspective, from Gerhardt's perspective, first of all, you actually don't see a lot of the Russian soldiers because he's generally up above them. Um, but also, you don't see a lot of the Russian people for the same reason. Uh, and so this really humanized the Russian uh, population at Stalingrad, who obviously uh, are, the, are the ones who are going to suffer horrifically. Uh, and, and, and really, it's so easy in any kind of, I think, war book to uh, have this sort of undifferentiated mass of humanity on the other side. And I think by by pulling out individuals and giving them just that little, just a few pages worth of story. And, and, and Wilbur really kind of just puts a human face on it. Um, I want to get back to the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, and probably for listeners who aren't familiar with uh, the ins and outs of uh, World War II Eastern Front history. Um, so let, let's I'm a first principles kind of guy. So let's start with some, some fundamentals. So where is Stalingrad? Stalingrad is um, it's on the banks of the Volga in southern Russia, not far from the northern border of Ukraine. So if you think of, I mean, now that we all have, I hope, a, a sort of picture of Ukraine and, and where it borders Russia, kind of in our minds from the last two years worth of, of news reports, there are basically three huge rivers three of the five biggest rivers in Europe, which run diagonally from sort of northwest to southeast. And one is the Dnieper, which runs through Kiev into um, the Black Sea. Just north of that is the, is the Don, which runs into the um, Sea of Azov, which is the little sea at the top of, um, of the Black Sea. And then the Volga, which is the longest of all the rivers, the longest river in Europe, in fact, which Stalingrad sits on, runs north of that, sort of over the top of the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov into the inland sea, the Caspian Sea, which, which sort of sits like a sort of lozenge from north to south to the east of the, of the um, uh, Black Sea. So if you're kind of imagine looking at it on a map, the the... Azov Sea is above the Black Sea, which is to the left of the Caspian Sea. And in between, and this is going to be crucial to this, yeah. in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea lie the, the lands known as the Caucasus, which are sort of Chechnya, um, Georgia, and Azerbaijan in current terms, uh, which have something very important, which is oil. And, and actually, Stalingrad, although it's, it's important because it sits on the Volga, which is that the, 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 those three rivers I've described have since the beginning of kind of historical time been arteries of trade. They are like the Nile through Egypt yeah. or, or the Mississippi through America or the Danube and the Rhine through Germany. They're the, they're the, they're the principal arteries of trade and have been since Viking days. Um, um, so Stalingrad does control trade on the Volga. So there is a strategic purpose to it, but that's not actually why German armies have kind of entered into where its regions. What they actually want, this thing called Case Blue, is the strategic plan for 1942 on the Eastern Front. Army Group South, which is basically the Ukrainian 
German army in Ukraine was meant to come north across those three rivers, across the top of the Sea of Azov, and then take a great big U-turn and come right back down again through the Caspian and hit the, um, the oil fields or seize the oil fields along the way, hopefully all the way down to Baku at the very southernmost point of the Caspian Sea. So there's basically the, 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 the strategy was, for, as I say, an, like a great big inverted U, up, across, down, get the oil. And part of that army was going to, the, the, that U shape, if you imagine the top of the inverted U, your flanks are very exposed. So part of the army was meant to just go along and keep the flanks covered from any Russians coming down from the north. Except, as often happened in World War II, Hitler had a cunning plan. The beginning of Case Blue went so well and so quickly, and they were rocking along so fast. He thought, yeah, yeah, it's boring just going and getting all that oil, which, by the way, was a complete fool's errand, because even if they got the oil, how are they ever going to get it back to Germany? But that's a whole other story. He suddenly thinks, you know, maybe, maybe I could take off part of that army and just nip into Stalingrad. Now, he says in his speech that the reason he went into Stalingrad, the speech in the Birkeler, the actual real speech, that the reason he went into Stalingrad had nothing to do with it being named after Stalin, but was actually because there was 30 million tonnes of, of, of trade went up through Stalingrad. And if you seized it, you could cut off Russia's access to oil and various other things. But Hitler was a lying psychopath. And, and I actually think it was because it was called Stalingrad. Is that true? And what's more, the ferocity with which the Russians defended it, which is completely unlike the defense of, as I say, hmm. Rostov on the Don, which the Germans took in their summit of 42, or Kiev, or, or any of other, cities, other, city, other cities other than Moscow or Leningrad. The ferocity with which they defended it, I am sure was because Stalin did not want Stalingrad falling into Hitler's hands, and Hitler wanted absolutely nothing more than saying, nee, 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 I've got Stalingrad, because it would be such an incredible propaganda victory and, and such a humiliation of his, of his enemies. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, I think, but maybe this is because I'm a writer and I think about human characters, yeah. but to me, it's a battle of egos, and, and you see it, in, in Ukraine now, not just in Mariupol, as you described, which is a very, very Stalin, Stalingrad-esque in terms of that, so the, 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 as, I think it's the Azov steelworks, isn't it? The, the steelworks that become, but, in, but also in Bakhmut, the way that, that the Russians, who are now kind of in the, as we're playing the role yeah. of, the, of the Nazis, yeah. charge into Bakhmut, think, yeah, we'll get this, we'll get this. And then once they're there, they do what the Germans do, which is they refuse to move yeah. out again. That, that actually, they just keep on throwing more and more and more men into Bakhmut, which is exactly what, what happens with, with the Germans in Stalingrad, yeah. and indeed the Russians defending Stalingrad. I mean, there are two million casualties. Two million. On, if you add up the two sides over this one city, it's, it's, it, it, there is no strategic justification at all for this to happen. Yeah. I mean, it makes no sense. But it's just that neither of these two men is prepared to let go. Yeah. And so this appalling human disaster occurs because of their will. Yeah, it's funny. I've heard historians kind of rubbish the idea, this idea that it's about the name and it's the prestige and the ego. And I, like like you, I don't buy it at all. I think Hitler understands the power of propaganda like no one else. Oh, God, yes. And Stalin has ego like no one else. So it, it, I, it boggles my mind that it would uh -huh. not enter their calculations. But look, 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 we're seeing it play out now. Who in their right mind does not think that the will of Vladimir Putin is absolutely central to everything that has happened in Ukraine since February of 2022 and the invasion of Ukraine? I mean, 
plainly it is. Yeah. And and on the other side, would Ukraine have hung on in the way it has, and would it have garnered global support in the way it has, if if its leader, Zelensky, wasn't fantastically charismatic and cool and everybody adores him kind of thing. So he's he's easy to portray as a sort of tremendous good guy and Putin is a tremendous bad guy. But Putin could at any point have stopped. A, he could have stopped the invasion in the first place. And he could even now have stopped the way in which it's presented as a battle against Nazism. Uh, Zelensky is Jewish. But also just... You know the 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 shelling of civilians, the bombing of civilians, the deportation of children from Ukraine or Ukrainian territory, former Ukrainian territory, into Russia, the the indiscriminate killing, the fish rots from the head down. It's it's, I mean, it's a bit like there's a there's a, when I when I was at university, there was a big thing of sort of structuralism. And one reason I never studied English English literature was there's this big sort of move in I think also in art as well to pretend that somehow books are not a reflection of their authors and paintings or works of art are not a reflection of their artists. Because it's, really, it's all just, you know, the greatest sweep of history or it's this or it's the reflection of society, whatever. This is just academics who can't bear the idea that there might be people who are genuinely creative <laughs> or can't bear the idea that people are genuinely powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's simply impossible. To, of course there are socio-political reasons for the rise of Stalin and the rise of Hitler. And the rise of Putin, for that matter. Indeed, absolutely. You can, you can absolutely describe why the particular historical circumstances, but in the end, the person who takes advantage of those historical circumstances determines a huge amount of what follows. Why else, for example, would people be so upset about the idea of Donald Trump becoming president again? And it's a hugely consequential election for a very important country. Yeah. It really matters. It's absolutely about, and, and uh, yeah, of course, I'm North, I think of people, but it's just impossible to account for Stalingrad without accounting for Stalin and Hitler. Just, you know. and, and, but what happens is that other people, as is happening in the Ukraine before our eyes, are then sacrificed on both sides to, to the whims of the people in charge. Yeah, and we've we've seen that uh, very strongly in Bakhmut with these sort of human wave attacks, um, and you see it uh, as a sort of the the um, the original uh, case really of in Stalin of this kind of urban warfare in Stalin. Right? Yeah, um, I was fascinated that passage I read out about from your from the book about where Gerhard sees the shattered buildings and thinks, mm. "Gosh, that's going to be pretty pretty difficult to take." Um, and my first thought when I read it was, "Well, that's a pretty obvious point." But then I reflected on it. I thought, of course it's not. Because actually, at this point in history, it's never happened before. We're in the first war where there's been real kind of bombing of, uh, of, of urban areas, because they weren't really able to do much of that in the Second World War, certainly in terms of then and then fighting them, having to fight in them. Um, and I think the bombing of Stalingrad, I think I've heard that uh, that initial bombing, I think it's two or three days worth before the, um, the, the, the tanks come in, is I think um, the biggest loss of civilian life in bombing raids until um, Hiroshima. That's right, yeah. Um, so it's it's an absolutely monumental uh, bombing effort. Uh, and if, it, yeah, of course, the German, because it's good that I get, yeah, as you say, they play places like Kiev um, and uh, I guess Warsaw and so on, they've, they, and Paris for that matter, um, they've rolled through without a lot of resistance. And so they've not had to They've never had to fight in a in a shattered city. The closest they've come, and this is is kind of indicative of the of the Hitlerian mindset. The closest they've come on the eastern front is Leningrad. So they've reached Leningrad Leningrad quite quickly in 1941. Yeah. Um, but the Russians have been able to hold on to it a bit, like with the, with 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 um, with Stalingrad. The Germans weren't able to take the entire city which meant that the Russians had a tiny foothold, which meant that they could supply across the Volga into yeah. that foothold. And when the Volga froze, it became consequentially easier in the winter. Similarly, in Leningrad, I think it's Lake Lagoda. No, not Lake, there's in Hungary. Anyway, there's a lake directly behind Leningrad, which basically they could supply across the lake. So Leningrad couldn't fall. 
it, it, it was a 900 day siege. What's fascinating is the Germans didn't say, okay, look, let's just not keep trying to take it. Let's just seal it off. Let's just make sure they can't get out. And then let's redirect our forces to a place we can take. No, they just keep sitting there, wasting huge amounts of manpower hmm. because Hitler can't bear the idea of, of kind of any kind of compromise or any kind of, his ego is so fragile that the, even the very suggestion of defeat, and of course, paradoxically, this then causes or helps to cause the ultimate total defeat. But so, so there has been this sort of pre precursor of the idea that Hitler kind of sometimes won't take no for an answer. And, and what happens in Stalingrad is, so Stalingrad, there's a Stalingrad front, so that in the middle of the front, Stalingrad is, is, is a, as a city. It's a rather odd-shaped city. It's kind of long and thin. I think I described it in the books like a snake because it follows the curves of, 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 of the Volga. And so you have the kind of north end, the, the new factories, and then the new city centre. It's been, it's been kind of made up as, as a sort of as a sort of um, vision of the future. It's a city which the Russians are very proud of because it's a kind of, it's a vision of, 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 the, of the Stalinist communist future. And then, and then the Southern end, you have sort of, it's almost like shanty towns, but it's actually kind of old town of the very primitive wooden buildings, which the vast majority of Russian people lived in really into the, well into the 20th century, kind of mud roads and stuff. Anyway, on either side of the city, as the, as the Germans pile in, their allies, their Italian, Romanian, and Hungarian allies are kind of guarding the, the flanks on either side of the, of the Volga, I'm sorry, along the Volga, on either side of the city. So the Germans go into the middle, their allies around the side. The problem then comes when in November, more or less absolutely within days, either coming before or after, very, very close, to, to the Hitler speech where he's being so blasé and saying it's not going to become another Verdun, which was, of course, the great meat grinder of the First World War. And he's right. It's not another Verdun. It's even worse than Verdun. Yeah. The Russians launched this thing called Operation Uranus, which is a pincer movement, um, very much like uh, Zulus at Isindwana, as described in a previous episode, and when the land feeds. <laughs> yeah. they, they kind of sweep round, they hold the Germans at Stalingrad and then sweep round on either side, smashing through the Italians and Hungarians and Romanians, each of which, by the way, lose about 100,000 men just in round Stalingrad. And if you think that the, that the total British casualties in World War II were 384,000 soldiers, airmen, and sailors killed, okay, which is an awful lot, but it's a fraction of who died just at Stalingrad, a fraction. Anyway, there's a point, a brief point, where the, the Germans can still get out of Stalingrad. Yeah. And and Hitler, of course, can't bear the idea that they would have to issue. His generals said, look, let's just fall back, you know, we'll create a new line, it's fine, didn't take it, cut our losses, Retreat, make an orderly retreat, which is quite a difficult thing to do, but it's possible. And let's just set up our, our next line of defense kind of thing. Hitler won't have it. And then Goering says to Hitler, don't worry, I can supply them through the air, which is kind of one of the things which, which, which you kind of get a hint of in, in Courtney's War, because he has these ludicrously overblown notions of how well he can supply this gigantic army with everything that it needs via the air. And of course, it's nonsense. Yeah, so, yeah. The, just there aren't enough planes. They get shot down. There's, you know, the landing grounds get bombed. It's just a disaster. Um, I mean, it's, if you think how hard it was just to supply a few people at Arnhem, for example, this is on a gigantic scale. And what happens is you get this this army that that is then trapped because it's not allowed to retreat. By the time, but it's, it's then becomes it's not even a question. They can't get out. So now they're just going to be squeezed. It's 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 the kettle, the kessel, as they call it, um, and they're going to actually have their own tactics played on them because this is how the Germans have captured huge amounts of territory on the way into Russia, which is doing exactly this kind of pencil movement. So the Germans are trapped. They have no food, they have no oil, they're running out of bullets. It's 
and it just it's just hell on earth and 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 that's the circumstance which gets worse and worse and worse from as you see in the book these these men just walking around starving men aimlessly trying to find some kind of escape when there is no escape except unless you're a pilot the one the only people who could get out were the the pilots and they stayed right to the very end and then they finally got out and that's how Gerhardt gets out of Stalin. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned the the Zulu tactic. And I remember when, when we had Saul David on the program, uh, he explained that you know, Zulu has had this idea of the, the horns of the buffalo. Mm. And what I'd never appreciated until he explained it to me um, uh, was that the point of the horns of the buffalo gradually encircling your enemy is not to push them back. The point is actually to surround them so they are trapped and then right. you can slaughter them all. You corral them. Yeah, but it's with a view to then absolutely slaughtering them all. Yeah. And of course... That's exactly what happens to the Germans. They are surrounded. They can't get out. And then, I know the Russians don't slaughter them all, but um, uh, they slaughter a whole lot of them. They do, actually, yeah. effectively. Yeah. No, they, they, effectively, they do, because um, the Germans lose about half a million men at Stalingrad. So, again, more than we lost in the entire war. And although quite a few of them are taken prisoner at the end, 95% of all those who are taken prisoner die in captivity. Yeah. So, so even if you had survived Stalingrad, you're, apart from the others, they're, they're half starved, they're ill. So it's not necessarily that the Soviets are being particularly brutal to them, although they were. But even with absent of that, you're talking about men who are on the ver- medically on the verge of death anyway. Um, but what's, what's ironic about this, and this also plays into to the present day, so so the Germans had used precisely these encircling tactics against the Russians the previous summer, very, very successfully. Yeah. And then seemed completely oblivious to the possibility that the Russians could have learned. Because one of the things that the, the Germans consistently do at this point is underestimate Russia's capacity yeah. for... for they, they kind of thought a bit like we do now, well, they've used up all their men. You know, and there are constantly new armies being formed, constantly new people being thrown into the battle. And, of course, their industrial production, which has all been transferred out of range of German bombers into the east of the Urals, is pumping out these T-34 tanks and AK-47, and, and an AK but, 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 but new planes, planes that can compete with the, 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 the German ones. And they, and they allow themselves to be trapped by their own tactics, which is ironically... That's sort of happening in Ukraine now. Yeah. That 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 as if and again Saul kind of mentioned this when we were talking to him after the show, but that that it's as if the Russians had forgotten their own history. And Stalingrad is still and it's like it's like the Battle of Britain is to British people. You know, one of those things which is absolutely seen as being, you know, their finest hour. It's like this this is what sums us up as a people. This is what we can do. And and somehow you're seeing it play out again with, with, with the Russians in the guise of the Wehrmacht going into the city, whether it's Mariupol or Bakhmut, and simply refusing to stop going into it and simply throwing more and more people into it and, and just as we're throwing themselves in this particular case. It's not even as if the Ukrainians have swung round. I mean, they're trying to, but they haven't yet swung round to encircle Bakhmut doesn't matter they behave the russians are kind of behaving as if they were circled anyway they're just they're just not leaving um and it's 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 one of these things where you know history repeats itself was it what, what once is tragedy and the second time is fast I'm, I'm not quite sure whether we're at the tragedy or fast stage but both actually um but it is it's extraordinary to watch the inability of human beings to learn from their own experience on a kind of gigantic geopolitical scale yeah, and the the Russian commander at um, at Stalingrad, I think, has a, has a very Russian phrase: uh, "Time is blood," um, and um, which is and which is applies to Bakhmut as well, isn't it? I mean, I think the, the Ukrainians have explicitly said there's no strategic value except in defending Bakhmut, except that we are absolutely grinding down the Russians, and the more men they send to, there to die, it's, it's mathematical. Yeah. If, if they can. If- if, if they can kill more of the Russians than the Russians can kill of them, if the, if the ratio is sufficiently high. But I mean, one of the things that, that I, I was just looking up today, actually, that the, 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 the I mean, Russia has famously a tremendous, a tremendous kind of demographic problem, um, um, which is 
that its population is, is dies young mm. and and is not um it's not um reproducing i mean it's it's the population of russia is declining so I actually can't afford to throw people in but just to go back to stalingrad and and the kind of way in which russia waged war then which was as it is now you just throw human beings you don't care about the life of an individual person you just throw people and you throw tanks and you throw anything you've got at the enemy and you keep on doing it until until you break them so in June 1941, before before Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, the Soviet State Planning Committee put the Soviet population at 205 million people. By the end of the war, it was 168.9. They had lost more than 40 million people, right? And now, partly because Russia, as currently constituted, is smaller than the Soviet Union, but also because they're in population problems. They're down to 143.4 million. So the population available to the leader in the Kremlin now is is 60 million fewer than it would have been um, 80 years ago. Mm. Um, so this this attitude, I mean, and, I, and one thing that's also really intrigues because because the German population has had similar problems. I mean, the the, the German population is in is in long term decline. And one of the ironies of the horrible things of the Second World War, many horrible things, is these two leaders who were both obsessed in their different ways with their race and their homeland and their people literally destroyed their own race. Yeah. So the number of Germans is declining dramatically, the number of Russians is declining dramatically. And you can trace it back, not entirely, but significantly to the gigantic losses of, frankly, breeding age males that occur and you'd females also, because the civilian losses in both countries are huge. Yeah, and, and as you dramatize, there are, there are women fighting in the front line. Well, yes, yes. And there are women, who, but there are women who, who don't have a man in the years when they ought to be having children mm. or are being bombed. I mean, half a million civilians killed, somewhere between five and 700,000 civilians killed by Allied bombing in Germany, let alone what the Russians do. Um, so it's, just kind of, it's a very grim, grim backdrop to 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 the um, story of Saffron and Gerhard, and uh, which then actually does become even grimmer in the course of in the course of, of Courtney's war. Saffron cheats on Gerhard. I mean, let's be let's be frank about this now. But, but I mean, but that's what happened in the war. I mean, women who were left behind in the war. I mean, the, the wartime London was probably, I, I should imagine that the kind of promiscuity of wartime London wasn't equaled, and I should think that's all the 70s, not even the swinging 60s, because the swinging 60s didn't swing for great numbers of people. But wartime London, what happens in war is very basic, human, primitive, atavistic urges, which is we need to reproduce. We're losing all these members of the species. And and you could be dead tomorrow, so let's make love tonight, you know. And 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 Saffron, after all, has has she doesn't know because she and Gerhard are separate. She, she has seen Gerhard once since the start of the war, very fleetingly. They've each spied each other, but that aside, she has no idea whether he's alive or dead. And. She's a young woman. I mean, she's, um, let me see now, she's born in 1918. So, you know, in the, about 1943, she's sort of 24, 25. So she's a young woman, absolutely in the prime of life. She's incredibly fit. She's been trained to kill, to sabotage. She's gone into SOE, where, where, women, where women, for the first time in British history, were trained to do absolutely everything that men were. So she knows how to, she knows hand-to-hand combat. She knows everything. So, you know, in Wilbur-esque terms, she's a healthy female male, a female animal in her prime breeding years. And, you know, and she's a lioness. She's a fantastic lioness who needs, who needs a lion. And her, her current lion is unavailable. So if another lion comes along, what's a girl to do? I think we've run out of time. <laughs> Justice is about to get filthy. 
Uh, the Battle of Stalingrad lasted for five and a bit months. The Battle of Bakhmut at the time of recording has been going for nine months and counting. Uh, and let's hope before we finish this podcast series, it's all over. Uh, but for now, we will leave you. Do join us again next time as we delve further into the exhilarating world of Wilbur Smith with a look at Birds of Prey, the first book chronologically in the Courtney saga. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from me, Tom Harper. And it's goodbye from me, Diana Thomas. The Smith Show is produced by Christopher Wynn. Music by Dewey DeLay.